Hello everyone, it's Tuesday, well, actually it's Saturday, May 11th, 2013, but it's still Harp Tuesday, and I'm sorry it's taken me so long to get an episode out, I've been, I've been really, really busy, uh, I've been busy getting this new CD ready, <laughs> Passage, Music for Solo Harp, I just recorded a short video about it, and I would certainly encourage you to go and buy a copy, I'm really, really, really excited about that. And the other thing that I've been busy with is getting ready to go to Rio de Janeiro for the Rio Harp Festival. And I actually, I leave tomorrow. So that, that's going to be really exciting, going to be great. I'm going to be blogging about that, so check out my blog at uh, joshlin.com. And uh, taking lots of photos, hopefully, and, and having a great time down there. But I wanted to do this episode of Harp Tuesday before I left. And it's the much-delayed episode about dealing with difficult sections. And I asked for your suggestions of a bar or two bars, a short little section that you are having problems with. I got some great responses. I'm going to look at a few things here today. I'm going to start with this idea of what do you do when you're faced with something and you're not quite sure how to finger it. And so just looking at some basic, that basic idea of playing around with different fingerings and finding the one that works. And before I get to some specific pieces, I'm just going to talk about uh, two topics which I'm not sure that I covered in my episode on fingering. And the first is the idea of uh, coming off the string. So connecting, or sometimes you might hear it called, um, uh, what's the term, let's see, connecting or uh, placing, right, placing. I, I'm used to the term connecting, but placing, same idea, where... <laughs> For a long section of music and not coming off the string. There's always at least one finger or thumb on the string. So that's all connected. And it's a really good thing to do. It's very efficient. For example, just if we wanted to do something like that, trying to do it where we're not connected is so much harder. So connecting is a great thing. But there's also sometimes the danger of going overboard the other way and connecting too much. So when I see something, and I oftentimes if I look at some fingerings and think, mm, I'm not sure that's quite the, the most best way to do it, it might be because they're not taking the opportunity to come off the string. So there are a couple things that happen when you do come off the string. And by coming off the string, what I mean is you, you're no longer, none of the fingers are on the strings, right? You're, you're completely off the string. So you have that little moment in time when you're not needing to do anything, when you're not playing, because when you're connecting, there's always a finger getting ready to play or playing, and, and there's all, always some muscles working. Whereas once you come off, you can, of course, get away from the string a little bit with a little wrist motion. And, and if it's a bigger thing, if you have more time, you, 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 know, you might use the arm as well. But it helps remind your body to relax. And it also gives it an opportunity to relax in a different way than we get while we still have the fingers on the string. So that is a, is a great thing to think about in terms of, of coming off. And also, it can help just in terms of the feel of a piece. So that when we have a long note, on the harp, of course, the loudest point is always the initial attack, and we can't do anything about that. But with a longer note like, that's supposed to sustain through most of the bar, for example, it can sound and appear louder if we are coming away from the string, kind of encouraging that sound or the people's idea of the sound to, to, to continue, whereas... You know, if you close your eyes, there might not be a difference. But watching it, I think there is a difference. We create that difference. And I think it also encourages you as a player to feel it differently. In other words, in terms of phrasing sometimes, we, you know, we want that sense of coming off. Kind of like breath markings, right, for a, a wind instrument where there are times when you want to 
take a breath, maybe even if you don't need to right there, just to shape how the phrase works. So anyway, thinking of, it's always good then to look for opportunities to come off. And those opportunities are when you have some extra time, right? When it's fast and we can connect, we're, we're gonna connect. Of course, sometimes we can't connect, you know, if you have a bunch of repeated notes, but you know, if you come across say a half note, chances are you're gonna to wanna to come off at that point. And that similar idea of if it's, if it's long enough, we're gonna take that opportunity to come off. And the other thing to think about is gaps. So that when we're playing around with trying different fingerings, it's a lot easier when you're crossing over or under to, to do it when you're just going from one string to the next. As soon as you start getting a gap in between, starts to become really awkward. So one of the things then when you're playing around with possible fingerings is checking the gaps and, and making sure that it works. So let's let's get to an example. Um, and this is actually a, a from a piece uh, one of my students is working on and one of some fingerings. And, and so I looked at this. Uh, the rest of the piece is reasonably straightforward, but here's this section where we have these seven notes going down and how are you going to finger them? I'm sorry. How are you going to make that efficient? And you know, they're fairly fast. So what you do is you, you sit down and think, okay, so four to one to start. That seems pretty straightforward. That's great. So we're going to have one on the top and we're going to start going down. Now there's a bunch of notes. So let's start with, with, trying to place four at a time because that's going to be the most efficient as I think I talked about in fingering you know it, it, it let's let, let's start with with a four to see if we can efficiently grab all these so well now we have a gap you know we can place these four we have this gap so it's but we'd really like to avoid that gap. And the other thing that we might notice is that we're gonna hear that E get stopped as we place four on it. So let's say, okay, well, that's possible, but we, we, we have this gap. Let's try, let's try one, two, three. Oh, well, then we have this even larger gap. gap kind of annoying uh, okay well we've tried one two three four one two three how about one two and now let's again let's default to placing four more notes well then we're gonna end up with a thumb on the bottom and that's generally you know if you're going down you don't want to end with a thumb if you're going up you want to end with a thumb so let's try one two If we do one, two, one, two, and then one, two, three, we have again this gap that we're trying to cross over. So let's try that one more time. So there's a possible fingering. Now, the, the disadvantage of that is that we're crossing over twice, right? So we could certainly still try this gap or with a gap and both of those might work as well partly it might depend on your hand you know I have these nice long fingers so this gap here is not too bad for me um, it might be much harder if with smaller fingers so you might want to stick with that fingering where you do cross over twice but there's no gaps so again that's just a way 
to you're just playing around with it and seeing trying to come up with what feels best and, and what works best. So let's take another example. This is a hollow poplar. It's a fiddle music. Looking at the looking at the right hand this time. A and we start this string of notes, which uh, starts starts at the end of this bar here. Oh, one more. So again, if, if you were just reading through this, you know, you you might start this upwards passage with four, three, two, one, because we see there's a bunch of notes. There's still a bunch of notes. Keep going, four, three, two. Oops. Now this, again, remember if we're going up, we want to end with a thumb as the top note, because we're going to go back down again too. We, you know, we, we want to be ready to, oh. Oh, whatever it is. Get out of it, but anyway, um, so with four, three, two, one, four, three, two, one, it doesn't really work. How about the start of it? Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna play the thumb, and we're gonna be set up to play whatever finger we want to start with. So again, let's start with three. Oh, three, 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 two, one, three, two, one, three, two, one. It's nice. We avoid the gaps. If we do three, two, one, four, and two, one, we also avoid the gaps. But in general, I think, and certainly for me, it feels harder to cross under with four, right? We got more fingers getting stuck underneath there. And we, I don't have a huge difference in terms of the difficulty between crossing under with three or crossing under with two. So that this idea of, what, three, two, one, and then four, three, two, one. I would prefer just three, two, one, three, two, one, three, two, one. And it has the advantage of, because it's always three, we're always crossing under with three, in some ways that's easier to, to, to sort of learn and it fits nicely. And the final thing, of course, that, so we have an option that seems, seems reasonable. How about if we start with two on the bottom? Well, oh, we ran into problems immediately because we got this gap that we're trying to cross under. And I don't think we're gonna get any sort of advantage out of it. We're still, we're gonna be forced to cross under twice, no matter what we do. So, uh, So again, it's just a matter of playing around with it, uh, seeing what works best, and sometimes it's just gonna be awkward, but trying to find the least awkward, least awkward thing. So the next thing I wanna talk about is an idea of a bag of tricks in terms of sometimes there are some fingering ideas that you might come across in a particular piece and that are good to keep in mind for other pieces. So that uh, one example that uh, came up recently when I was teaching is and I think I've mentioned this in some pieces as well, is this idea of sometimes when you have five notes going up and they're not a scale, when they have these gaps in them, you can do place four, three, two, one, and play two followed by two again. gap and of course this is only for going up so that's just a little thing that if you've never seen that in a piece of music you, you might not be aware of it but once you are aware of it every once in a while it's going to come in really handy because it is a reasonable way of, of fingering a section like that or uh, you know one of the pieces I've been working on is, is impromptu again which is on the CD and and there's a number of times including at the end, where we have this pattern, which if you've never seen it, maybe that's how you try to finger it. But it goes really fast. And 
Okay, is if not, you're not going to be able to get the speed. Whereas if this idea of placing all four of those notes and playing them out of order, which we normally wouldn't do, right? You know, we're going up just and then down. So normally we'd wait to place three, but placing all of them. Let's you play that at a really, really fast speed. So again, just being uh, remembering when you come across something interesting that you maybe has never seen before in terms of fingering and keeping that in mind for dealing with other sec sections where maybe you come across the same thing. Um, so then I'm just going to talk about thinking outside the box in terms of looking for other solutions when you come across something apart from just f fiddling around with the fingering. And one of the first things to think about is, can I take this in the other hand or parts of this in the other hand? So that, you know, another piece I'm working on is the, the um, slow movement from the Sonata number 23, the Beethoven Passionata Sonata. And I'm ending up in, in this fast, uh, fast section. I'm taking a lot of stuff that's written for the right hand in the left hand, um, which helps give the right hand a little bit of a break and make it so much easier so that uh, we have not only maybe some of these long sections where you might automatically think about it, where we have... Uh, Of course, it's a little faster than that, but also some of these chords as we go on where, you know. Where as it's written, it's. Uh, so much harder because not only are we playing almost all those, not only as it's written, are we playing almost all those notes in the right hand but we're also not giving that right hand a chance to come off and to rest and give that momentary respite. So, you know, always thinking about, hey, maybe can I take part of this in the left hand? Or maybe just the lower note of a chord in the left hand? Or maybe the top note of a chord in the right hand? And, and just being aware that you do have both hands to work with. So that's one of the things you can think about in terms of thinking outside the box. Um, and. Now I had this, I had a question about this, this uh, lovely piece by Defaya. And you've got this little, it's fairly slow, and you've got this little right hand thing that keeps happening. is what to do when we get to a spot where we're repeating on the C. Doesn't sound that good because we're hearing that C get stopped and there's not really anything you can do about that. You know, I'm being really good at delaying that placing as much as possible, but we're still going to hear that C get stopped. So. In a situation like that, of course, this would be fine on the piano, which it was written for. We're not going to hear that. We don't have that stopping effect. So thinking outside the box and thinking, well, let's see, what can I do? So one of the first things that pops to my mind is enharmonics. If this is being played on a pedal harp, you could put that, you know, put that D into sharp. And now we have a second string that also is a C natural. So that's easy. Now we can do. problem. Sounds really good, right? We get that. We could even, and again, you know, this idea that you don't necessarily have to play exactly as written in terms of which hands are playing which. You could do, which might be a little bit easier. You might not do that because most of the piece has this going on so that 
in other sections where you're not having that enharmonic and being able to do. If you could do that through the whole way, sure, I think it's probably a little bit more efficient because we're doing two and two instead of one and three, so it's giving both hands in the same amount of time to rest. But because we have a lot of this four, one, four, probably just staying the same would be the way to go. Now, if you're using a, a Lieber harp, you could, of course, tune that D to the B to natural and, and then make it sharp. But that's a problem because we start with a we start with a B flat. So again, it's possible that you could play around with the tuning there. I mean, you could have that B flat be an A sharp down here. Again, you tune that A to natural and then put it into the sharp position. Um, which is a bit of a reach then, unless you also retune this. So enharmonics then would be one thing to think about. In other words, having a, a string be the same tone as a, the other string. Or if, if that's not gonna work, you might say, well, I guess I'm just gonna move, maybe I'll try moving something down an octave so that we get to my ear, that's better than try it up here but then you're kind of kind of get here it gets stopped or even here but that I think messes with how it was originally written a lot more than anyway but that idea of playing around with possible solutions to to these to these problems that arise and and again, thinking outside the box that split the hands up. Can you move things around and up and down an octave uh, and harmonics and, and basically just being ready to experiment and find a way to make it work. So hopefully that was useful. And as I said, I'm going to be in, in Brazil starting tomorrow for 10 days, I guess. And uh, so there might not be an episode Two weeks from today might be three weeks, but hopefully something soon. And uh, in the meantime, take care. Cheers.